Ron Sabold grew up in the suburbs of Toledo on the shores of Lake Erie. The Army brought him to Texas in 1978, and after his service, the UT Drama School brought him to Austin. A popular and talented actor, Ron nonetheless turned his energies to writing and coaching other writers. His first book was a novel, Viral Times. But as a lifelong baseball fan, Ron knocked one out of the park with his family memoir, Stealing Home. It weaves a memorable story about his role as a divorced dad and the lessons he learned during a summer trip to catch nine baseball games in eight states over 11 days. After performing a reading of his new memoir for an enthusiastic audience at Austin Liddy Limits, Ron sat down for an interview with our Scott Semigren. Ron, uh, your previous book was a dystopian science fiction novel. Was it difficult for you to switch hats to a memoirist? What I like to say is that memoirs are novels that came true. So shifting gears from writing something that happened in the future really brought the same sort of skills along to the next book. I still had to do characters. I still had to do settings. The difference was there was a lot more at stake in this book than in the first one because it actually happened and I knew the ending to it. I mean, one of my shifts that I had to make is I had to learn, make, learn to make scenes shorter because while I was writing the novel, they could be as long as I dreamed that they would be when I was on stage, and I'd have those big, meaty speeches. Tighter with the, with the, uh, with the memoir. How difficult was it balancing the two subjects in your book, fatherhood and baseball? There's a tricky balance that you have to manage between these two things because Lots of people have experienced fatherhood in some way, and many people care nothing for baseball. But the non-baseball people have been very patient with the book. I needed help. I got help from a workshop reading group that I led, as well as an editor, so I could find the balance that I might not bore the non-baseball people, and at the same time, do the fatherhood stuff that I knew was going to drive the entire book. When it gets down to it, people come for the book that they want to read. Come for the baseball, stay for the parenthood, or come for the parenthood and stay for the baseball. What does literary success look like to you? It looks a lot like this, right here, right now. I get to read a book, now, I get to perform a book. Someone asks me questions about the journey. People I care about who have helped me along the way are here in the audience. Their book's in the back, and maybe somebody will take one home, and I get a chance to talk about it and maybe sign one. This is a very, very happy year for me as an artist and as a writer. It's the best part, right? Yeah. If you could tell your younger self anything, what would you, what would you tell yourself? Get to work. I would tell them, uh, don't cover up the hard idea with gilded fancy writing. I would say, be sure that you know it's going to be better later on. Understand there are people out there who care about what you're writing, and they will help. I mean, people think about writing as such a solitary pursuit, but it's full of support. It's, a lot of it is like making a movie or putting something on stage. That young writer thought he was all alone. And he probably was because he thought that way. So, you know, and I'd tell him, boy, that book won't write itself. That's right, a good writer needs a team. Yes. Readers, editor. Yes. Yeah, well, and you know, I'm, I read something the other day that said the difference between a professional writer and one who's not is the professional writer knows he needs help. 
and ideally reaches out for people that know something he doesn't know or can see something that he can't see. How does running a writer's workshop and being an editor help you as a writer? I'm really lucky. My life is surrounded by creative people. They're just full of ideas and inspiration and insight that I don't have. Also, with running a writing workshop and an author coaching practice, um, I get the opportunity to learn things that I have to pass along. They say, we teach to our deficiencies. <laughs> and I have plenty of deficiencies to teach to while I have people to help with their books. Do you read your book reviews and how do you deal with the good ones and the bad ones? I read every one. Old habit from when I was on stage. We'd rush to the newspaper and the weekly and we'd go, did they mention me? <laughs> so they always mention me when they're writing a book review. Right. And I revel in the good ones and I really hold my breath when I open up the emails from Kirkus and Forward and Indie Reader and Oh, they liked it. It's that, it's that, uh, that um, um, Norma Ray moment. Right. They like me. They like me. They really, <laughs> really <laughs> like me. <laughs> and for the ones that are not good, they're teachable moments. Not because anybody's going to be teaching me about writing from a bad review, but it's a moment for me to learn how to give them grace because they have an opinion and they're entitled to it, and they connected with the work in some way, even if they didn't like it. I mean, the only thing we can really do is try and get them to read. The rest of it is sort of out of our control, really. Have you received a, a bad review that you felt was helpful? I only have one so far that's curious. It showed up on Goodreads almost immediately. Uh, it was, thoughts soon, and that was it. And I think she gave me three stars on a five, and everybody's going, I wonder what that's about. Does your family support your career as a writer? What does your son think of being one of the protagonists in this new book? Well, so my family supports me as a writer in ways both literally and spiritually. Um, my wife is a yoga teacher. She has three DVDs. and. Together, we buck each other up on the bottom line while we're creating stuff. It's really important. We read each other's things, we consume each other's things before the rest of the world can. There's no greater gift than somebody who loves you and can be honest with you at the same time. And you love them after they're honest with you. I, Nikki absolutely supported me in this particular book because we'd go to lunch and I'd ask him, what happened there? And he said, well, I think we ate the Tomei triple, and, and then there was this, and he'd say, Dad, I think you got the details on this one. So, I mean, for him, he gives me his forbearance. He puts up with whatever my version of the story turns out to be. Because, like I say in the book, memory is a map that's drawn by people who were there the actual truth of what goes on is sometimes between the lines as well. So his grace in that, in letting me know that it's okay for me to tell my story, that he was a part of, what a gift. Excellent. So right now is the time in our show where we do the lightning round. It's something that we stole from inside the actor's studio with James Lipton, who stole it from Bernard Pivo, who stole it from Marcel Proust and on and on. So, the first question is, what's your favorite word? Safe. What's your least favorite word? Bully. What turns you on? Movie soundtracks and happy memories that make me cry. What turns you off? Willful, arrogant ignorance. What is your idea of happiness? As a book is ending, I am sad that it is going to leave. Who's your favorite author besides Scott Simmergren? Larry McMurtry. Excellent. If you could be a character in a well-known novel, who would you be? 
Augustus McCray in Lonesome Dove. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Second base, right in the middle of the order. What profession would you least like to attempt? A bitter book critic. <laughs> Last one, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say at the check-in desk? Your books are right up by the register. <laughs> People have been asking if you'll read them a story. <laughs>